For years and years, one of the biggest frustrations for me in my home studio was recording drums. I felt like everything I saw online was telling me that I don't have a good enough space because this room isn't very big, or I didn't have the right tools. I didn't have the right microphones for recording drums. And today, I just wanna dispel a lot of those myths. And I wanna tell you that you yourself can get a great drum recording, even with some budget-friendly stuff. So in today's video, it's all about the tools, techniques, and tips that I have for you when it comes to recording drums in a home studio environment. I think you'll see by the end of this video that nothing in this room is essentially elaborate. I don't have very many pieces of gear that wouldn't be affordable to you, even if you're just starting out in a home studio. I wanna say this though, my channel's got hundreds of videos at this point. So I don't mean to skip over some of the basics, but if you're looking for something specific like how I specifically tune my snare drum. Well, I've got a specific video for that on my channel. In fact, I've made many videos about tuning the drums, so I don't mean to gloss over anything in this video. Just know that there's more information out there if that's what you need. I wanna be as concise as possible, but this is gonna be quite the deep dive. If you yourself are a drummer or you own a home studio and you're looking to get a good drum sound in your home studio, well, today's video is for you. Feel free to skip around on the chapters. I'll have those linked at the bottom of this video. So if you already feel like you got the tools and you're ready to start recording, feel free to skip ahead. Best thing you can do is hit the like and subscribe buttons. This video is part of a series of videos where I'm recording what's called the YouTube song. So the YouTube song is kind of a silly song I've got so I can avoid all of these massive copyright strikes that often hit music production channels. All that out of the way, let's get started in recording drums. So the first thing we need to obviously talk about is the drum set. The set I'm using is a Pearl Forum series. This is very familiar back in the day, this would be like the entry level kit from Pearl. Now, many people will scoff at my drums and I can understand it's a very starter entry level kit. I did put coated heads on all of my drums. So snare drum, kick drum, front and back, toms, two different purposes. The coated heads seem to not have as much ring or sustain to them. I don't do a lot of jazz drumming. I don't need my toms to sing. I just want them to kind of be more tubby. So I go with a coated head. It's gonna have less resonance to it. Now, coated heads are also great because by the time you start seeing the coat start to peel away, where you see that clear coat coming through, that's when you know you need to replace your drum head. So they kind of serve two purposes for me. You can also use brushes on coated heads. If you try to do the brush thing on clear drum heads, it just doesn't work. So that's my drum set. Now the snare drum is one thing I wanna talk about. This was a gift from my wife. It is a Pearl Masters Maple Snare Drum SST. These are somewhat affordable, but the thing is that snare drum will cost just as much as the Pearl Forum kit cost itself. So when you're acquiring drums or when you're purchasing drums, by all means, get whatever kit you enjoy. If you like the way it looks, just go for it, put some good heads on it. But I would recommend that you prioritize the cymbals and the snare drum. The cymbals and the snare drum are often the most identifiable parts of the drum kit to whether something sounds good or not. So if you have a great sounding snare drum, if you have great sounding cymbals, you should be able to get a good drums mix. I've got a video specifically on, my, specifically on my channel when it comes to the hi-hats. So I've got three different sets of hi-hats. I've got the Zildjian A Custom Series, which are kind of more of the, they're gonna fit all sorts of genres out there. I'm using the K Constantinople Series, which is by far some of the most expensive ones that you can get. And then I've also got some Sabian cymbals, which are more reminiscent of what you get in an entry level. You can check that video out if you want to, where I compare all three sets of cymbals. I definitely think the A Custom route is good to go for most people. Get whatever cymbals fits your genre or whatever you like to record with, but the cymbals and the snare drum should be top priority when it comes to the kit. First of all, when it comes to drumsticks, I'm a big fan of just the Vic Firth nylon tip drumsticks. The reason I use nylon tips is because though I like the sound of a wood tip and wood tips are great, they often break very easily. So a wood tip, as it starts to break, it'll start to get flat on one side. So if you have access and you just wanna spend a lot of money on having multiple drumsticks, check out the wood tips if you want to. But if you have a set of nylon tips, these things are basically gonna last forever. As long as you're not going like Travis Barker on your drums all the time, I don't really break drumsticks ever. Maybe like one set of drumsticks I've ever broken, but these are the American Classic. I'm using 5AN. The smaller the drumstick you use, it's definitely gonna have an impact on the tone of what you're getting when you're recording. But the thing about smaller sticks is that they're also gonna be quieter. So if the, if you get a pair of like seven Bs, those are some of the smallest 
drumsticks you can get. It's almost like holding a pair of pencils. You can get smaller sticks and that'll have a quieter sound to them, but I stick with about the 5A in. 5Bs are also good. They're gonna be a little bit larger than that. Next, I wanna talk about the TuneBot, which is actually a clip-on tuner for drums. So if you're familiar as a guitar player, you have clip-on tuners for your guitars. The TuneBot is a clip-on tuner for drums. Now, this thing does run, this is the TuneBot Studio, runs about $100. You can get a TuneBot that's like $69. It's just a smaller version. I don't think there's anything wrong with the smaller version at all. It may just have less features as far as saving presets. But if you're like me when you're using the TuneBot, you basically just wanna get all of your lugs to the same amount of tension so that you don't have that warbly sound on your drum. So check out the TuneBot if you can. It's gonna save you a lot of time when it comes to tuning. And I've got a lot of videos on my channel already about that and how to use it. The next thing is Moon Gel. Moon Gel is gonna help with some of the ringing that you get on the drums as you're tuning. You don't wanna put the Moon Gel on until like the very end of tuning. So make sure your stuff is in tune and then start putting products like the Moon Gel on as well. And the last thing I wanna talk about is this gaff tape. When it comes to dampening the drums, what I will do, this big roll of gaff tape will last you years, but typically just take a piece of gaff tape like this, tear off a piece, fold the sticky side in on itself so you have a little bit of a booklet here so there's no sticky part on any of this. Then tear off a much longer piece of gaff tape like this. Place the non-sticky side at the end. So what you have is basically this device where <laughs> you can stick this to the rim of your drum, basically the not on the lugs or anything, but place it on the rim of your drum so that the non-sticky side is sitting on the drum. So when you hit your drum head, like the snare drum or whatever, this thing will actually bounce up in the air and then it will come back down and it will dampen the drum for you. So people have done this with wallets in the past. If you have like a floppy wallet or something, whenever you hit the drum, the wallet bounces up and then it comes back down to kind of choke off the cymbal. It's almost like a gated effect on the drums. Use the gaff tape if you don't have access to moon gel because with gaff tape, you use this all over the place. You can use this with microphone cables. It doesn't leave residue like when you're using electrical or duct tape. Good stuff to go. So as far as dressing the drums, I highly recommend the Ambassador coated heads. On my kick drum, I'm using a coated Ambassador on both sides. And very important that on the resonant side or the outside of my bass drum, I've got a hole cut out so that I can mic up the kit, which brings me to the microphones. When it comes to recording drums, you don't have to have like seven or eight microphones on your drum kit, but I will say that the more microphones you can record drums with, the better. So if you haven't gotten into audio interface stuff yet, hold off and make sure you get something that you can record eight microphones at the same time. Now, Sure makes a kit that has three SM57s and a Beta 52 inside. That is a great starting kit because what you can do is take the Beta 52 and put it on the kick drum or the bass drum on the outside, then the three SM57s, take one of them, put it on your snare top, and now I'd recommend taking the other SM57s and using them as a pair of overheads. They want you in the kit to be using them as tom mics, but if you're limited to just four microphones and you've got that drum kit, I recommend you use two of them as overheads because that'll catch your cymbals and your toms as well. It'll give you a nice stereo image and it'll give you more of a sense of the room. If you close mic the toms, the snare drum, and the kit, the kick drum, you're not gonna get a lot of cymbals, you're not gonna get a lot of air, and your drums are gonna sound kind of dark and muddy. So here are my microphones as follows. On the snare top, I have a Shure SM7B. Good to use your three finger technique. So if you take three fingers, place them underneath the microphone, and you should have that amount of distance between the top of the microphone and the head on your snare drum, for instance. So go with three fingers and you'll be good to go there. The Tom mics are these Sennheiser clip-on Tom mics. I just like them because they're a low profile. If you had done like earlier when I was talking about the SN57s, the SN57s are gonna stick out about this much, but I like these low profile Tom mics. And often when it comes to mixing, I'm not really using the Tom mics until I'm hitting a fill. So I'm gonna mute pretty much everything other than that boom that comes through on the Tom mics. So the Tom mics, I believe, are like E905s or so. There's two different types of Sennheiser clip-on Tom mics. This is the a little bit more expensive version. I've used the more affordable ones before at church. I wouldn't notice a difference between the two if you had them side by side, but I've got two of those on the rack Tom and the floor Tom. Then of course, like I mentioned earlier, I have a Beta 52 from Sure. This is on my kick drum mic. I've got it 
pretty much inside the hole on the kick drum head, but it's a little bit outside. So the more you go inside the kick drum, the more you're gonna hear the sound of the beater, you're gonna get more attack, but kind of less low end. If you have it further outside of the kick drum, you're gonna get more low end, but you're gonna not get as much articulation from the beater. The next important thing is when you're miking up the kick drum, I've got a blanket on top of my bass drum and it's kind of taped down with a little bit of this gaffer's tape. There's nothing special about the blanket. It literally could be anything, just a little bit thicker than a bed sheet. What it's mainly doing is it's trying to keep out the sound of the cymbals and the snare drum from getting into my kick drum. I'm still gonna use gating when it comes to the bass drum. I don't want the kick to have the sound of all the cymbals and stuff in it. So I use that blanket over the top, kind of like a quilt. I'll tape it to my bass drum so it doesn't move anywhere. And speaking of moving anywhere, I've got some weighted bags on the bottom of my bass drum. So as I'm playing the kick drum, it's not gonna be sliding forward or backward. It's sitting on a little rug and it's got some weights holding it in place. Last but not least, just because it's always plugged in, I have this Neumann TLM 103. It's basically just a large diaphragm condenser mic and I'm using it as my room mic. Typically this is like what we record vocals with, but I have it plugged in anyway. So I've got it plugged into channel seven and that thing is gonna record the ambience of this small bedroom. Now, why would I want a room mic in such a small bedroom? Well, even though this is a small bedroom, the distance that I have from this microphone to my drums is roughly about six to eight feet. And even that small amount of space is gonna give more of a sense of space and an air quality to my drums. I don't have this mixed high, like in the mix. I'll have this turned down quite a bit. It's almost like a reverb track for me. So I'll mix it just like a reverb. I'll cut out a lot of low end and just leave all that crispy detail that comes through with the cymbals and stuff. Now, all of my drum mics are plugged into a snake. So a snake, essentially, we see this in church all the time or live sound situations. It is just like a stage box where we've got all the microphones plugged in and then it's got this long tail. I believe it's like 50 feet and it goes through the side of the wall over to my Sapphire Pro 40. So here's where we're talking about audio interfaces. I'm using a Sapphire Pro 40, which is an old Firewire interface. I've not actually got this plugged in via Firewire because it has a standalone feature. So I'm essentially using the Sapphire Pro 40 like an external microphone preamp. I'm not using it as my main recording interface. If you can find something like this where it has an optical out or ADAT out, I've got all of eight channels going through an optical cable to my RME Babyface Pro. So this is a two channel USB audio interface. I've got two channels I can use for preamps, microphones plugged into this. And then of course I got eight channels on the Sapphire Pro 40. I know that the Sapphire Pro 40, as far as modern gear is kind of obsolete at this point, but you can easily get this thing used for like 150, 200 bucks. It's a great option if you're just getting into recording. And you'll notice from all the gain knobs, most of them are not turned up above 40% at all. So we're not really getting like a characteristic sound of the Sapphire Pro 40. It just sounds like a preamp. So that is being plugged into my RME Babyface Pro. Then my RME Babyface Pro has a really long Roland headphone extension cable. I believe it's like a 20 foot cable. And of course that's plugged into my headphones. These are closed back headphones. Bayer Dynamic makes these DT770 Pro. Just make sure when you're getting these, there's options for the ohms. So 250 ohms, you're gonna have to turn up the headphone volume pretty loud to get these things cranked, but these are more recommended for recording drums because they can handle really loud sound levels. And the last bit is the recording software. So there are so many different options out there. If you're a Mac user, you already have GarageBand, which is free. So make sure you just download that from the App Store. That'll get you up and running. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with GarageBand. There's just not a lot of people out there using that primarily. So if you're getting into recording, check out the artist version of Presona Studio One or some of the introductory versions of things like Ableton Live. Logic would be a good way to go. If you know that you're gonna be using a lot of electronic stuff or virtual instruments, 
by all means go with logic because they have the built-in auto drummer which comes in handy if you're just looking to drop in a drum track and you can't record drums so whatever digital audio workstation you're using i'm the type of person where i just want the software to act like a tape machine so i'm recording my tracks in i'm doing a little bit of eq a little bit of compression i'm pretty much done i don't get heavy into virtual instruments and samples with all that you can check out ableton live fl studio or logic but for all intents and purposes i think studio one for most people out there is going to be middle of the road what you need to get going and i don't see anything different between it and pro tools as far as sound quality i tried out pro tools for like six months i didn't really get blown away by it and i didn't think it was worth to continue to keep paying for it i had studio one so by all means use whatever you can afford and what you're going to be comfortable with so here I've got the YouTube song in Presound Studio One. Like I mentioned, this is part of a series of videos. So I've already made a video explaining how I set up the arrangement, how I've done the guide tracks for this song. All you need to know is that if you're looking to record drums in any sort of software, as soon as you can have some sort of guide track or a demo track, that's a great way to go because you don't want to be playing just to a metronome. It can require a lot of your imagination to know where you're at in the song. So even if you just grab a microphone and just speak a song like a verse a chorus just to have something to play along with would be great so you can drag and drop mp3s as well into presound studio one so if you have a file like someone else's song and you want to play along with it simply drag and drop it in it will create a new track in studio one and you can play along with that and record tracks as well so the software i'm using is presound studio one like i mentioned logic pro tools they all allow you to do what's called multi-track recording which means that we're layering stuff on one after another. So back in the day, if you're in the studio, everybody had to be in the same room and they had to hit record at the same time and they play along and it goes straight to tape. Well, modern technology allows us to do what's multi-track recording. We can actually overdub. We can add things to what was previously recorded simply by navigating around. So if you're new to PreSound Studio One, again, check out some of the videos on my channel, how to record your first song. But essentially we have a guide track we have a demo of the song all the way through. That's not gonna make it into the final mix. It's just so I know where I'm at. I've got this small folder here of vocals. That's for the intro of the song. You'll hear this kind of acapella chorus. And then you see two drum folders, okay? So I've already recorded the drums to this song, but I wanna talk about the way that I recorded them. So if you go up here in Presound Studio One and click Add Tracks, for adding my drum tracks, I essentially just call them drums. And I tell it I want to record seven drum tracks. So it's going to ask you basically how many microphones are you recording? In my situation, I've got seven. I've got a kick, snare, tom one, tom two, hi-hat, ride, and a room mic. That's seven. So I put seven of them. And I check this box for pack folder. It's going to put them all into a folder for me just so visually I'm not looking at 50, 60 tracks at the same time. And then I typically color my drums red. So drums are going to be red most of the time when I'm recording, you can pick any color you want. And it's gonna ask you for your input. So this is gonna be specific to whatever interface you're using. Basically on input, you just wanna make sure that you got your first one selected and then we can change them later if we need to. Output is gonna be the main output nine times out of 10. When you click okay, as you can see, it created this folder here. I can click and drag any of these folders around, move them anywhere I want. If I want the drums to be at the top of the screen, I can just click and drag. But if I open up the folder, the benefit of using a folder is whatever I do to that folder is gonna affect all of the tracks inside. So when you're recording drums, for now, you want to affect your snare drum, kick, tom tracks, all together. You don't wanna start moving your snare drum around. It's gonna mess up your kick as well. So when you're recording drums, even though there's multiple microphones, try to think of it as being one cohesive instrument with different parts at one time, okay? So when I click the record enable button on the drums folder, you can hear my voice. Test one, two. Test one. Two. I click the blue speaker icon because depending on your audio interface, I don't use the software monitoring. As you can hear, there's a delay. So as soon as I turn it on, test one, two. Test one, two. There's too much latency. Latency is gonna be a delay from the time you strike a snare drum to the time that you're hearing it in your headphones. To avoid as much latency as possible, you need to use what's called hardware monitoring. So your audio interface most likely has some sort of switch or it will have some sort of dial 
where you can make sure that you're hearing what's coming from the preamps and not what's coming from PreSonus Studio One. If you're hearing what's coming back to you from the software, there's gonna be some sort of delay. So to avoid that, I just turn off this blue speaker icon. The red icon means record enable. It means as soon as I hit record, it's gonna start recording these tracks for me. But before we do, we need to change the names. So if you double click anywhere on the names, like this one says drums one, I can rename this to kick. And then before I hit enter, I hit tab. Now I'm on the next one. I'm this one snare, tab, tom one, tab, tom two, tab, hi-hat, tab, ride, hi, tab, and then room. Now that they're named properly, I need to change the input so that they all match up. So here on the word kick drum, I can click this one and go down to where I've specifically got my kick drum coming through ADAT3 on my audio interface. Your audio interface, if it only has two inputs, it may just come up as input one and input two. If your kick drum is plugged into input one, obviously you want your kick drum to come through input one. After that, we have the snare drum. So I'll click this drop down menu. I'll go to where mine's labeled snare, which is coming through the fourth channel on my Sapphire Pro 40. And essentially, I'll do the same thing with all my other tracks. So we have Tom 1, Tom 2, the hi-hat's coming through ADAT1, ride cymbal is coming through ADAT2, and then my room mic, which is this TLM-103. As you can see, I'm already getting a signal here on the preamp. Speaking of preamps, my audio interface has digitally controlled preamps, so I don't have a physical knob on this RME Babyface Pro. But when you're setting the input volume for your microphones, best thing you can do in PreSonus Studio One is click the Mix tab. And then over here on the left side, you see an option for inputs. If I tap this TLM-103 right here, you can see the TLM-103 is getting a signal. Now this bar is floating just above negative 36 and below negative 24 on the meter. You don't want to go all the way up to zero. I'll show you what happens. So if I go over to my software for my RME interface, if I crank this preamp gain, watch in the background on PreSound Studio One, you'll see it starts to do something. It's called clipping. So that red bar is very bad. It's bad because when we're clipping a signal, you are shaving off those transients. We don't want to see any sort of clipping. And when you're recording drums, you'll find yourself clipping quite a bit because when you're setting a volume for your snare drum, if I hit my snare drum with a stick, as you can see, not just the snare drum mic itself, but this TLM-103 clipped, even though it's on the other side of the room from my snare drum. So it's very important that you check all of the levels on your microphones. Let's hit it again. You can click the red rectangles in Studio One to make sure that the clipping is cleared out, it's reset. All of your tracks, you go to your drum set and make sure you're hitting them as hard as you're gonna hit them. Like the ride cymbal, go ahead and hit it as hard as you're gonna hit it. Make sure you're not clipping. Usually I wanna aim for between negative 12 and negative 24. Negative 18 is kind of the sweet spot. It's gonna be plenty enough of a healthy signal that you can balance it later. You can always turn up the volume of tracks for the most part, but turning them down is gonna be a lot more complicated, especially if you've already clipped your converters and your preamps, okay? So make sure everything's at an appropriate volume. If you've got knobs on your interface, have your drumstick ready, go ahead and hit something like the floor tom. As you can see, tom two is floating between negative 12 and negative 24. So that volume gain is good. This may not sound natural in your headphones because you typically don't want your hi-hat to be just as loud as your toms or just as loud as your kick drum. But you got to know that mixing is going to come later. So we're forward thinking. Don't get caught up in the moment of just listening to what sounds like in your headphone mix. We can mix these tracks later. So once all of the gain has been set on my drum pack here, you can go up to the drums folder. And as soon as I want to, I can just click record down here at the bottom of the screen. As you can see on Preson Studio One, it turns green whenever it's recording. And if I hit the space bar, it will stop recording. Now, when it came to recording the drums, I want to use the click track. 
At the bottom of the screen, you have your tempo. My tempo is set at 85. To turn on the click track, just hit the C key, make sure the metronome icon is blue, and you should be hearing a metronome in your headphones. This is what it sounds like. Again, a closed back pair of headphones is highly recommended. You wanna make sure your, your click track is not so loud that your microphones are picking up the click track volume. So good, solid, isolated pair of headphones is gonna keep the click from being picked up by the microphones. After that, I basically just wanna click on the drums folder. If I've got the metronome on, I'm gonna to go to the drum set and I would hit record. One thing I've learned when it comes to recording drums specifically, if I'm having to step away from the computer, is that you need to record things in stages. Unless you're going for some sort of brag effect of saying that you recorded something from beginning all the way to the end, I highly recommend you try to record like one verse at a time. You can set a loop region up in your software so that you're just playing the verse part over and over again, and then you're selecting a take. So for instance, I created my drums folder just like we did earlier, and you notice I recorded from the acapella section, I recorded the intro and I recorded verse one, and then I stopped recording. I stopped recording and I only did that much so that I could go back to my software and take a listen to make sure that nothing went wrong. I wanna make sure stuff didn't clip. You really, it can be discouraging when you're recording an entire song. You go back to your computer, you put on your headphones, you take a listen, and something sounds bad. The snare drum mic had some sort of crackle in it then you've got to re-record the entire song. So always try to record thing in sections. So I created a drums folder. I right clicked and I hit duplicate track. When I duplicated the drums track, it made a second folder called drums two. And as you can see, drums two started recording in the middle of verse one and went all the way through the pre-chorus. Then I went back to drums one and I recorded from the chorus turnaround to verse two. And then from verse two, you can see how it's broken up into sections. This is so much more enjoyable when it comes to recording drums because you can have the satisfaction of, okay, that section sounded good. I'm happy with that section. Now I can move on to verse two. If you're trying to record something from beginning to end, it can get really, really frustrating. So I highly want to encourage you to not do that. But now we need to consolidate all of our drum tracks because I don't wanna be mixing two different kick drums. I wanna have the same mix on both of my kicks. All I have to do is essentially grab this kick two track. I can click and drag it up, put it in the second folder. I'll do the same thing with the snare, same thing with the tom, tom two, hi-hat, ride, and room. Then I can right click this drums two folder I can remove the track. All right, so as you can see, we've got all of our drum tracks consolidated into the same folder, but it would be better yet if I had all of my drums consolidated into individual tracks. So I don't want kick one, kick two. I wanna just have one kick drum track. Now, aside from using buses, one easy thing you can do is select, click and drag all of these drum tracks together. Then with all of them selected, you can zoom in right before pre-chorus one, and I'm gonna hit the cut. So if you hit three on the keyboard, you get a slice tool, and notice when I click, everything has been cut. With all these things cut, I can then select this individual kick drum track, I can hit delete, I can hit delete on snare, delete right here. So I'm deleting where I've got this overlap. And as you'll see, if I make a cut as well over here, right before chorus one, can make a cut and I can delete where we have this overlap. I'm just selecting them, I'm clicking on the track, and I'm hitting the delete key. So now you can see we don't have any overlap of the tracks. Now we can smush them together. So if I select all these tracks in the middle that used to be in drums too, I can just click and drag these up. Now we can see we've got a kick drum track that goes all the way across. But before you deselect them, hit X on your keyboard. And what that will do is it will create a crossfade so that these audio tracks seamlessly go together.
So now we can take a listen going from the end of verse one into pre-chorus one. I'll solo just the drum tracks. Okay, sounds good. Now I'm going to do the same thing. I'll speed this part up. I'll do the same thing for the rest of the song. I just want to consolidate all of my drum recordings. So we're looking at one track for each. Now my drum tracks have been consolidated. I can just right click each of these over here. These extra empty tracks, right click and remove selected tracks. All right, the last thing is for this song and for the sake of the video, we're not getting into mixing. You can check out other videos on my channel specifically on mixing the drums that you've recorded in PreSonus Studio One. Not everybody's gonna be using this software, but I did add a little bit of EQ compression and reverb just so you can kind of hear a more polished version of the drum tracks. I'm gonna play this song all the way from the beginning to the end so you can hear the progress up to this point. And then afterward, I'm probably gonna solo some of the drum tracks without any plugins on them at all so you can know what unmixed drums actually sound like. That's kind of getting lost in modern mixing. We're using a lot of samples and things that are already polished. It's good for you to hear some unmixed drums every now and then. So here is the YouTube song up to this point. I'll hit play, let's take a listen. Hit subscribe and maybe like So this video can have a chance In the algorithm's dance Hit subscribe You probably didn't notice At 8 a.m. today Published yet another video. You probably scrolled right past it, so I thought that I might ask that you go back and give it a try. It's 96% of those that watch my video have yet to hit that button called subscribe. If you don't mind me asking, I'd like to take a chance To see if you would kindly apply Hit subscribe, maybe like So this video can have a chance In the hour of stance, hit subscribe As the views began to rise You'd think that I was rolling in the dough But I got a notification A copyright violation So here I am asking one more time Cause 96% of those that watch my videos Have yet to hit that button called subscribe if you don't mind me asking, I'd like to take a chance to see if you would kindly apply. Hit subscribe, maybe like, so this video can have a chance in the algorithm stands. Hit subscribe. Six percent of those that watch my videos have yet to hit that button called subscribe. So if you don't mind me asking, I'd like to take a chance to see if you would kindly apply. Hit subscribe.
right, now I'm just gonna solo the drum tracks without any EQ compression or reverb, so those have been bypassed. Essentially, we've just done some gain staging, and then we move the faders around on the drums. So if I solo those here, starting at the halfway point of pre-chorus one, we'll go through a chorus or so. This is what the drums just sound like coming fresh out of the audio interface. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe and like, and I'll see you in the next video.